very warm welcome to each of you as a, another program of The Voice of Truth Comes Your Way. We greet each of you in that blessed name above every name, the name of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. And in his name uh, I greet you, the host of the program, Paul Fry. In my lifetime, I have lived through the Great Depression of the 30s and then through the different recessions that have <clears throat> unfolded since then. And we're going through a recession right now. We find we can't <clears throat> buy the things that we would like to buy all the time or we can't maybe take the different vacations that we would like to take. But I'd ask you a question. Do things really satisfy? Certainly in my experience, I've never found anything to bring satisfaction to my soul. Oh, there's a temporary enjoyment. But I've learned that the things that really have meaning and purpose are the things that are spiritual. And that's no uh, revolutionary uh, development because God created us a spiritual being. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 it says, Let us, God speaking, make man in our image. And how does God describe himself as a spiritual being? So that he created us in his own image and after his own likeness as spiritual beings. He has <clears throat> not only uh, created us in his own image, but he has created us so that we can commune with him and know him. But from the very beginning, uh, sin came into the human experience, and sin is lawlessness against God the Creator. And our first parents were lawless against just one command that he gave. And uh, from that time on, then uh, there were other... Uh, thing, uh, and sin separates us from God. But God so loved the world that he knew from the very beginning that man would sin. So he sent his prophets. He called out Abraham for the sole purpose of revealing himself. Not only in the work that he did, not only his creative and acts of deliverance through the nation of Israel, but through the prophets that he gave to Israel. And then the fullness of time, he uh, sent his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take upon himself humanity and dwell among us. And as we look at his life, the record of the Lord Jesus, what do we find? Where was he born? In a palace or in some <clears throat> well-to-do hospital that would... Um, take care of royalty? No, he was born in a stable where the beasts of the field dwell. And he was laid in a manger. And then throughout his life, what kind of a life did he live? Did he live a life in luxury? No. He lived a life in poverty. It is said in Luke 9:58 that when someone said, I want to follow you, I want to be your disciple, he said, well, you better think twice about that because he said the foxes of the field uh, have holes, their dens to dwell in, and the birds ha of the air have nests. He said, but the Son of Man, referring to himself, have nowhere to lay his head. What was he communicating to the children of men? Simply that life is more than eating and drinking. He came to establish the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking and things. It is righteousness and joy and peace in the Holy Spirit. Yes, he gave us richly all things to enjoy. Let me read from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. And we read these words. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Then it goes on. That they do good, 
that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time that they against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. In other words, the things that God the Creator gave to us were meant to enjoy. The creative work of God shows his kindness and love to the children of men. But what has the children of men done? They have become so encompassed in the things and the works, uh, his creative works, rather than the Creator. And so what do things do then until we come to know the true and the living God? They draw us away from him and we center on his blessings rather than him, the blessor. And so what I'd like to do today in our Bible study is look at an Old Testament uh, personage that I think is very instructive that we can learn from. And I've entitled this message, pitfall of temporal things. Temporal things are good, but they are to be used as God the Creator intended them to be used, not to glorify and indulge ourselves, but to glorify Him, the Creator. And so let me read now from Genesis chapter 13, and I'll begin at verse 6. And the background to that, in chapter 12, we see how the Lord called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He was living in idolatry at that time. He journeyed up, to, that was in around Babylon or Iraq today. Then he journeyed up to uh, Haran, which is, is in Syria today. And then eventually he journeyed down into the land that God promised to give to him and his seed forever. The land that much bloodshed is occurring right at this present time. And... Uh, but before he left, he was entrusted with the care of Lot, his uh, brother's son. He was, uh, Lot was his nephew. And after they arrived in Canaan, the promised land, they ran into a famine. So Abraham and Lot went down into Egypt. And they were there for a period of time. And during that time, they accumulated a lot of goods, a lot of cattle. And they became rich, both of them, each were their own individual businessmen. I'm picking that up now as I start in verse 6. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. Now here they were, two that knew the true and the living God, and they were in a land that was inhabited by heathens that had created their own gods. And what a testimony that is when <clears throat> people that claim to know God have strife openly before those that they are supposed to be a testimony to. Well, that was true right there in the very beginning, back in Abraham, with Abraham and Lot. And Abraham said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. See, Abraham had come to know by faith the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, no, he wasn't born yet. No, but he knew him because the Bible tells us that he rejoiced to see the day of the Lord and his heart was glad. And so he had come to know the uh, peace with God and the peace of God that only God can give. And right away we see how peace, uh, the peace of God had touched his heart. He said, <clears throat> I pray that uh, let there be no strife between us. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, and everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And when he lifted up his eyes and saw that well watered plain, he already had a lot of cattle. You can just imagine the cash register jingling in his mind because it goes on to say, um, <clears throat> even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt as thou comest unto Zohar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other. 
Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked, and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. In other words, they were lawless against God's moral government. And from that passage, I would like to share just a few things that will help to show you the pitfall of temporal things. God gave them to enjoy, not to argue over or to have strife over or for them to become a God to us. And the first thing I'd like to share is that did you ever think, did, did you ever see things that pertain to the eternal bring strife? No. It's the things that are temporal that bring strife. And we have already read uh, that, you know, what happens oftentimes is that those that work for an employer, many times they'll reflect the spirit of the employer. And certainly that was true in Lot's case, but not in Abraham's case. So they're arguing over land. You know, that's nothing's new under the sun. Later in the New Testament, we find the church of uh, Corinth, the, the members there, arguing over things, even going to court, which was a reproach to the name of Christ. And then we also find that there is one thing that success is bound to do. Unless success is under the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ, success often breeds contention. Someone has said that the mother of contention is ambition and covetousness. And certainly this uh, happened there in the account that we just read. But we also know as we go on, we find that <clears throat> um, temporal things also blind. They blind the eyes. How often the eyes see something that's very uh, profitable, that will add to the bank account, and certainly the thing becomes magnified in the mind. When Lot saw the well-watered plain, I already said how the cash register must have been jingling in his mind, and so his eyes saw, his heart coveted, and then uh, what unfolded was his decision to go there. Well, now let's reason together. Let's, there's enough in Scripture to show what the eyes will do. David, he saw Bathsheba taking a bath, and he took her. But then he would say later, Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity, and quicken me, O Lord, in thy way. Solomon was greatly favored of the Lord until he began to look upon the beautiful women, heathen women. And before he knew it, he was caught up in marrying them and worshiping their gods. Achan saw a beautiful Babylonian garment and a wedge of silver and a couple talents of gold, and he took of the accursed thing. And uh, Demas, he was a disciple for, for a while, until what? The world became too attractive for him, and he, went, he left the ministry and went after the world into Thessalonica. And that's the sad thing about things, that things turn us away from the true and living God who hath given us richly all things to enjoy, not only temporal things to sustain us, but eternal things, eternal life, eternal blessings that we can enjoy now and have in fulfillment totally when we graduate to glory. But then there's something else too that I'd like to share uh, with you. You see, temporal things do something else. They blind us to evil and wickedness. Let me read again in verse um, 13. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, when it says exceedingly before the Lord, it means they were arrogant. They were defying the law of God. In other words, they were very open in their sin. Now, did uh, Lot know about this? Of course he knew about that. But you see, the watered plain and the temporal gain and how his and riches would increase, overshadowed what he knew was not good for his soul. Because temporal things that cause one to lift them up above what they were intended to do, 
is inviting great hurt to the soul. In other words, what happens, we're more concerned about the welfare of temporal things than the welfare of our eternal soul. Now, what is the consequence? What was the consequence of all this? And with that, I'm going to turn to Genesis chapter 19. Chapter 18 speaks about how the Lord in one of his uh, visits, pre-incarnate visits, uh, the, I guess a theological term with that would be a theophany when he appeared to Abraham and uh, he informed Abraham that he was going to have to bring judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. And so uh, let's read that account and I'll come on as we go along. Verse 19, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. Not only had he settled in Adam, in Sodom, but Sodom settled it in him, and he gained. He came to affluence, and certainly authority, because to sit at the gate means he must have been the mayor of Sodom. And and Lot sat, uh, and seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. The angels appeared as men, and he said, "Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early." and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we shall abide in the street all night. Even his home was not welcome to the divine presence because it was become so uh, loaded with the environment of the city that he dwelt in that it wasn't even attractive to the angels of God, messengers from God. And he pressed and he urged them upon, he, and they, he said he evidently, he begged them to come in. He says he pressed upon them greatly and they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast and he did bake on leavened bread and they did eat. But before they laid down, now notice the sin of Sodom. The men of the city, even the men of Sodom, Sodom encompassed the house round about both old and young, all the people from every quarter. Now what did the men want to do? And this will show you that the homosexuality acts that is dignified in our culture today. Notice what, notice how God condemns us. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out that we may know them. In other words, to have sex with them. And Lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, brethren, do not wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Can you imagine a father having been so blinded or so affected by the wickedness of Sodom that he'd give up his daughters? But he knew who the visitors were. But look how far he had sunk, the consequence. <clears throat> Only to these men do nothing, for therefore came they unto the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. In other words, he didn't have any influence at all upon Sodom. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they worried themselves to find the door and hear God in his grace and mercy. The Bible says Lot was a righteous man. He could only have been righteous not because of his own good works, but because he had, Abraham told him about the true and the living God. And he came to have faith in the true and the living God, but he went the wrong way in temporal things just blinded him and now he's paying for it. And the men said, Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place for we will destroy this place because the cry of them has been very great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law which married his daughters and said, Up, get you out of this place. For the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law how he had no influence at all. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened, Lot saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, so much had Sodom gotten into his heart, the temple things that he even 
lingered, stayed as long as he could. And upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. And then he goes on to say that uh, his wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. And when they had gotten out of the city into the place designated, it says, <clears throat> you'll see it on your screen, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. I'd like to share briefly with you some things that I have jotted down, <clears throat> temporal things, when they control us, can bring consequences. First, this righteous man, I had said before how he was called righteous. Notice his soul was vexed day by day with their unlawful deeds. Notice it doesn't say sinful deeds, unlawful deeds, because that's what sinful deeds are, unlawful against God's moral government. And secondly, <clears throat> they had lost, he had lost divine protection. In chapter 14 of Genesis, Another uh, king came to invade the domain of the king of Sodom and took away everything, even Lot and his family. And then uh, in chapter 14, we find that Abraham and his servants went after and rescued Lot. You see, when you have another God beside the true and the living God, you just deliver yourself from divine protection. And then thirdly, he had no influence to change the evil that prevailed. And no one who is living in the midst of wickedness and there's no ch and and he's no different than the others, or he doesn't testify of his living God, of the truth. He's not going to have any influence. And then I told you about the divine presence did not feel welcome in his own home. And then notice what his heart craved for. He lost. He lost everything. All that lured him down into uh, the plain that was uh, adjacent to Sodom. He lost everything. He lost his wife. He even lost his two daughters, daughters, which we'll see later. And then <clears throat> he lost his dignity and his honor. How? By parroting children by incest. And here, this was the last uh, consequence. As we look at chapter 19 and we look at verse <clears throat> 36, uh, or uh, 34, and it came to... Uh, Verse 33, after they had escaped and judgment had came upon Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain, <clears throat> and they uh, made their father, uh, verse 32, come, let us make our father drink wine and we will lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night and the firstborn went in and lay with her father and he perceived not when she lay down, when she lay down or when she arose. And came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, behold, I lay yesterday with my father, let us make him drunk this, uh, with wine this night, and, and uh, you go in and lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drunk with wine that night also, and the younger rose and lay with him, and he perceived not when she lay down or when she arose. They thus both were the daughters of Lot, with child by their father. One was named Moab, the other was named Ammon. What a, what a price to pay. When your mind and heart is caught up with temporal things. Now, as I close this passage, and there's so much more I'd like to share with that, these things are written for our learning, that we might, through comfort and patience of the Scriptures, have hope and turn the right way. In, <clears throat> uh, we find that the city was destroyed, but I'd like to read Jude chapter 7, verse 7. The, uh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner and giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, and I will mention the sexual sins that uh, Sodom was guilty of and Gomorrah, it says, are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now that's in the scriptures so that we might know. We can defy God's moral government. And even if we've come to know the Lord, the consequence of letting temporal things be our God instead of the true and living God. There is a price to pay when we magnify what God has given us to enjoy in a normal way. But when we make it a God, we certainly will pay the consequences as Lot did. And then also, we need to examine ourselves. Where do we stand with God our Creator? Have we found refuge for our soul in the Lord Jesus Christ like Abraham did? We, he rejoiced to see the day of Christ, as I already indicated. And I just ask you this, have you really come to faith in the Lord Jesus? In other words, is your hope, in other words, the most important thing in life, is it things? 
Is it the things that appeal to the eye, eye gate, the ear gate, the taste gate, and the feel gate? Is that what motivates your life? Or is these things, uh, give, do you understand these things are given for us to enjoy by the true and the living God? Have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Cast your lot with him and he will save when you call upon him in truth and in repentance and faith. God bless you until we meet again. Right.